morning to everyone. Welcome to the Foreign Policy Research Institute's event. We're commemorating the 45th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, and this is part one of what will be a two-part series with some esteemed guests. You can catch part two, which is going to feature Laura Rosenberger, who's the chair of the American Institute in Taiwan. That's going to take place next Friday at 3 p.m. I'm Michael Beckley. I'm the director of the Asia program at FPRI. And on behalf of the organization, I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're watching here live or watching later on FPRI's YouTube channel. For those of you here now, I'm going to be taking questions for Matt Pottinger here. So I encourage you to put some in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and then I'll switch over to those uh, when we get to the latter half of the conversation. Last but not least, thank you to our supporters and members. Some of you are here in the audience this morning. Obviously, we could not do events like this without you, so we're really grateful for the opportunity. Okay, let's talk about the man of the hour here. Um, after graduating with a degree in Chinese studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Matt Pottinger became a journalist where he spent seven years reporting from China for Reuters and the Wall Street Journal. In 2004, he joined the Marine Corps where he served as an intelligence officer in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then when he came home, he worked on Wall Street for a bit. And then in 2017, he joined the Trump administration's National Security Council, serving initially as the senior director for Asia and then as deputy national security advisor. Matt Pottinger is now a fellow, a distinguished fellow at the Hoover Institution and the chair of the China program at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He is a co-author and editor of the forthcoming book, The Boiling Moat, Urgent Steps to Defend Taiwan. Matt, welcome. Thanks so much for being with us. Michael, it's great to be with you. Thanks great. for having me. Well, let me let me kick things off with a quote from you. This is you writing with Andrew Erickson and Gabe Collins in Foreign Affairs. Quote, Washington and its allies face many potential geopolitical catastrophes over the next decade, but nearly all pale in comparison to what would ensue if China annexed or invaded Taiwan. You go on to say, make no mistake, whether one cares about the future of democracy in Asia or prefers to ponder only the cold math of realpolitik, Taiwan's fate matters. So let me let me start with a question to just kind of as, try to establish what what you think is at stake here. Um, if if Taiwan were to submit to Beijing's rule and just be absorbed as a province of China, what what would happen next? And in particular, how would that affect life here in the United States? Thanks, Michael. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Gabe Collins and Andrew Erickson. We we uh, co-wrote a chapter uh, in in our book, uh, The Boiling Moat. Uh, on, on this, and, and you saw sort of a, an adaptation of that in foreign affairs recently. Um, look, if if the people of Taiwan decided that um, it, it was in their interest to join uh, together with mainland China, um, uh, we're, we're not we're not standing in the way of uh, the people of Taiwan making a decision uh, democratically uh, to do that. Right now, there's no appetite among the people of Taiwan to do that precisely because they are a, a prosperous uh, democracy with the rule of law. Uh, and Beijing is a single party dictatorship with increasingly totalitarian ambitions. And so um, the, the, the scenario that we're concerned about is one of a coercive annexation where uh, Beijing uses force or uh, the credible threat of force to uh, to sub Taiwan and the consequence uh, you you could simplify things, but just by thinking of it in terms of a uh, a, a geographical and geopolitical uh, component, uh, which would be very detrimental to the other China's neighbors and particularly for the democracies of of uh, East and Southeast Asia. Uh, there's also uh, the aspect of what it means for democratic governance and the rule of law uh, in, in other societies. What does it mean for sovereignty for other countries, even for countries that don't enjoy um, democracy? Uh, people in those countries, say Vietnam, do care about their sovereignty. And if Taiwan were taken, it would be much, much tougher for Vietnam to defend its sovereignty. 
and, and then, uh, of course, there are the economic effects as well. And those, in the words of, uh, uh, of uh, Kenneth Griffin, said that there would be an instant global uh, uh, Great Depression in the event that Taiwan were taken. And that, that is because, inevitably, the supply chain for high-end semiconductors and for, even for a lot of the foundational, more uh, older generation semiconductors that go into everything, um, would uh, uh, we, we would find major supply shocks that would reverberate for years and years uh, in, in ways that would be very damaging for the global economy, including China's. The, the problem is that as a Leninist dictatorship, we see uh, Chinese leaders talking in, in sort of zero sum terms where they're willing to, to have the Chinese economy suffer. In fact, we're seeing that now, even, even without a war, uh, Xi Jinping is is happy or can seems certainly uh, content to uh, allow significant pain for his uh, economy uh, just to prepare for war and to uh, move forward with this economic model that he has in mind, which is which is really about acquiring leverage over other industrialized nations uh, by dominating supply chains and and. Uh, weaning China off of any kind of dependency on uh, industrialized uh, countries. So, so, so you'd have economic shocks. You would, you would have um, Beijing using Taiwan as a springboard, basically a major military base to be able to project force uh, around Japan, around the Philippines and deep into the Pacific. Uh, and that would not be the end of it. We know that revanchist dictatorships um, don't have uh, uh, much appetite control. And once they get started, they tend to uh, uh, set their, their sights on other countries. And in the case of Japan, you can read Chinese uh, military doctrine. It says that once we take Taiwan, we'll have the ability to impose a blockade at will over the Japanese islands. Uh, and um, uh, th that would give them enormous coercive leverage. It, it could provoke a broader war, or it could provoke some kind of a capitulation by uh, countries in the region where they choose not to go to war, but they effectively become vassal states of uh, the People's Republic of China. So in, in short, you'd see, you'd see even far worse effects than even what we're seeing emanate from the Middle East and, and the wars that are taking place there now, and, or from Europe, where uh, the Russians have invaded Ukraine. OK, well, it sounds like it's better to nip these kind of problems in the bud than let them fester. And the United States, as you well know, has a whole apparatus that's designed to do that. One part of that is the Taiwan Relations Act, which says it says a lot of things. But one thing it says is uh, the United States must, quote, maintain the capacity to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or the social or the economic system of the people on Taiwan. Um, I take it that you don't think the United States has been fully sticking to the letter of that law. Uh, you know, the United States only has a couple of military bases within 500 miles of Taiwan, and China is pointing lots of missiles at those U.S. spaces right now. China's Navy is growing rapidly. The U.S. Navy is shrinking. And American arms transfers to Taiwan have, have stalled. My understanding is there is something like a $19 billion backlog of weapons that were ordered years ago that still haven't made it to Taiwan. And these are really important things like anti-ship missiles, drones, torpedoes. Um, war games show the US military is gonna run out of missiles in a few weeks of combat with China. You probably saw this CSIS report that showed China's cranking out new weapons at something like five times the speed of the United States, has more than 200 times the shipbuilding capacity of the US. And yet US defense spending is barely increasing. It might actually be declining when adjusted for inflation. And it stands at sort of mid 1990s levels of spending relative to GDP um, and less than half the Cold War average. And so my question is, is why? But what, what's the holdup? Because it seems like there's bipartisan support for the United States to stand up to Chinese aggression. The United States obviously has a huge economy and defense experts 
my sense is they've generally agreed on what the basic strategy for defending Taiwan is, whether you want to call it a, a porcupine strategy or I assume the boiling moat is a much improved and better version. But the basic idea is you lay down sort of a high tech minefield of missiles and mines and drones near Taiwan that can just tear apart a Chinese invasion uh, force or a blockade force. So it seems like we have a viable strategy political support and lots of resources, and yet the cross-strait military balance seems to be getting worse and worse every year. Why? What's the holdup? Yeah, I mean, we're, part of it is um, this historical pattern where democracies uh, do a lousy job at deterrence, um, but become fearsome uh, in war. The, the problem is we don't want to repeat that mistake. We are repeating it right now. Uh, we, 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 we allowed Adolf Hitler uh, to, to test uh, red lines and bottom lines. Probably the really key one was in the Rhineland when, when he, you know, you, you read the histories and you find that Hitler was at his most nervous when, when he moved into the Rhineland because he, was, he knew that if France and the United Kingdom and others uh, had taken action at that point, uh, things would have crumbled for Hitler. Uh, but having having tested that bottom line and having exposed uh, the 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 French and the British and others as feckless, um, that gave him the confidence, and it, it also gave him more political support within Germany to then go on to uh, far more destructive uh, uh, campaigns that led to a, to a world war. Um, right now, we, we we're sort of in a post Rhineland moment already. Right now with, uh, uh, you, you might even put it at 2014 when uh, Crimea happened and, and the world really didn't respond to the fact that Russia had, had uh, invaded its neighbor in Ukraine. And then, and then eight years later, a full blown invasion follows. And here we are with the worst war in Europe since World War II. Uh, we saw the failure of deterrence in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, the deterrence of the Taliban. We've seen the, the failure of deterrence against Iran, who's using proxies to run wild, uh, attacking Americans and our warships and, and Israelis and others in the Red Sea and across the Middle East. So um, we're, we're already perhaps post Rhineland. And so uh, it would be a lot cheaper for us to get our act together now and shore up deterrence rather than uh, have to uh, wait until uh, it's too late to avoid a hot war. But right now, that 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 is at, at what's stake here. So these are these are historical. You're a historian. You know the pathologies that that afflict uh, democracies are uh, clearly hard to shake because we're we're falling into these same traps. But you uh, you also mentioned um, that w w we do have a consensus about who our primary adversary is. Uh, we do have the ability with, with our dynamic economy and with the incredible innovation that we've got and with a, you know, a, a world-class military, we have the, the makings of a de uh, effective deterrence policy. And I'm actually optimistic that if we get our act together, we can very rapidly start to counterbalance that shift in the balance of power that you just described, Michael. Uh, in, the, in the boiling moat, and we use that phrase I, I, I uh, got from a, a Chinese friend of mine, this phrase, Jin Cheng Tang Shi, which means, uh, you know, metal ramparts and boiling moats. It's a phrase that comes from a Han Dynasty statesman about really the danger of trying to take on strong points like Taiwan that, that enjoy metal ra ramparts and boiling moats. And, and Taiwan literally has a moat. You know, I mean, what, what, what Ukraine would give to have Taiwan's democracy, what Israel would give to have Taiwan's democracy. Taiwan has a natural advantage as a defender and defenders have a natural advantage in war. It takes a lot more mass to take and invade a, a country than it takes to defend it. And, that, and that's only amplified by the amphibious invasion that would be required to cross that boiling moat. So the center of gravity for China in, in in my view, is actually the Navy. It's the Chinese uh, maritime lift that we would be required to get their army across the straits. Uh, and that is where we should be focusing our efforts because uh, with a relatively inexpensive 
set of investments. We can hold at risk the, the most exquisite and heavily invested part of China's military and, and sink a, a significant portion of their fleet to the bottom of the Taiwan Strait rapidly. Uh, so we look at some of the capabilities that would be required. By the way, these technologies already exist. This wouldn't require uh, new sort of, you know, spooky uh, space age technologies. It's things that we already have in the arsenal, but in insufficient quantities, particularly the munitions that you talked about. China, what you described is all, also true. They have the most fearsome industrial uh, machine that we've seen since the Nazis in the 1930s. This is the largest peacetime military buildup by any country since the Third Reich. Uh, and, and we should not take any of that lightly. It's why I think we should also be taking greater steps to undermine uh, Beijing's efforts to convert its, its wealth into military power. It's not in our interest to see that process go smoothly for Beijing. And as part of your approach in the boiling moat, there's a couple of questions from the audience I'd actually like to incorporate where they ask, should the United States still be investing in large surface combatants or are they sitting ducks for a war with China? Um, and what do you think, how does the boiling moat approach sort of dovetail or clash with the replicator initiative that's recently been rolled out? Well, look, the, the, the replicator initiative um, is, uh, is a uh, smart approach but it is supplementary to um, the, the existing, what you could call legacy platforms that are already in the U.S. arsenal. We already have heavy bombers that could reach uh, Taiwan in, in a matter of hours from the, from the continental United States. They can carry anti-ship, you know, these long-range anti-ship missiles. Uh, if, if the Air Force would only purchase them, they could buy even more cheaply these things called PJDAMs. It's a powered joint direct attack munition. These are, these are, we've got zillions of these 500 pound laser guided bombs, but you, you just retrofit them with a couple of little wings and a, and a motor and, uh, and a new targeting package. It's only several tens of thousands of dollars a pop, not, you know, peanuts. They used to spend that much money on toilet seat covers at the, you know, the <laughs> Pentagon, you know, and, and uh, those things would give the Chinese Navy a very hard time. You can and and they can and they can fly back, come back again. You've got constant sorties, so suddenly you've got a, a. It's almost like you're replicating the U.S. attack submarines force, which is also going to be very very important uh, in in a Taiwan scenario. But they will run out of ammunition. Our 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 submarines once they run out of torpedoes, they've got a long trip back uh, to the west coast of the United States, and then coming back again. By then, things it may be too late. So we're looking at existing platforms. We're looking at how do you rapidly scale up munitions production. And I think we should have a, a moonshot right now, uh, almost like we had with the Operation Warp Speed. Remember, we completely flipped the old model for vaccine production on its head very quickly and broke all the records for creating new vaccines by, by giving market incentives to a number of players where we said, look, if your vaccine fails, will will still back you but you but uh, but but you guys need to hustle and and get something ready so that if it passes clinical trials um you've already got the stockpiles you need to vaccinate people we need to take a similar approach for uh for munitions production okay so we'll be strapping uh, missile launchers to barges putting uh, engines on jdams and just kind we can of do all that kitchen so replicator replicator is 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 more about the next generation of asymmetric uh, weapons using large quantities of relatively cheap drones, um, using um, uh, more types of uh, ISR, you know, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance satellites and, and drones and other things that can be rapidly uh, replaced in the event that China is blinding our satellites. Um, and so it's it's a an asymmetric, low cost set of additional capabilities that will be dangerous for China and, and do more to help uh, counterbalance. But we think that the things that are already in our arsenal, one of the things, you know, uh, Chris Cavoli is the U.S. general. He's the, he's the uh, European uh, senior mil military commander for the United States and Europe. And, and, and he has said that we cannot sunset our legacy military platforms in the hope that 
there'll be a, a rapid sunrise of new capabilities. You can't you can't get stranded at midnight between that sunrise and sunset. You need to actually continue supporting those legacy systems uh, and bringing, look, the Ukrainians are using a lot of old fashioned stuff that has been absolutely essential in these wars, including artillery tubes and, and lots, of, uh, lots of artillery shells. So we, we can't neglect those things in the hope that these new technologies will save us. Okay, you know, you mentioned uh, democracy and how as great as it is, it can, democracies don't have a great record of um, preparing in advance and deterring threats as opposed to responding to them after they've already exploded. And I wanna ask a similar question about Taiwan, which is one of the world's most successful liberal democracies. I think the fact that uh, a huge percentage, almost I think 40% of the legislature is um, with, with uh, women leaders. You've had a female head of state. I think that's a broader indicator of just how well the Taiwanese have, have done with liberal democracy. But it also seems like Taiwan may suffer from some of the democratic deficits that you mentioned, because as China has spent the past decade and a half arming, as you say, at a rate that we haven't seen since since Hitler, since Nazi Germany, prior to World War II, Taiwan has been arming at what I would describe as a Western European level of uh, militarization, you know, in the 2010s, spending something like 1.8% of GDP on defense. Now that's been boosted to a whopping 2.6% of GDP in the last couple of years, but that just seems like small potatoes compared to what China is doing. And so same question I asked you for the United States, but for Taiwan, why, like why, how, how can this be changed? And, and again, what do you say to Americans that maybe hear stats like that and think, wh why should the United States be sticking its neck out and defending a nation that doesn't seem to be taking its own security seriously? Yeah. So I, I do think Taiwan does take its, its own security seriously, but they've also been lulled into a sense of complacency by, uh, first of all, facing the Chinese Communist Party across the strait for, for decades now. Uh, people have, have gotten used to the idea of Beijing saber rattling, but not actually uh, committing forces. Uh, th so that that's part of it. I think that Beijing has also uh, been a very effective with some of its its uh, information warfare in trying to persuade uh, lull the people of Taiwan into this false sense of security that uh, you shouldn't arm, or if you do arm, that will be provocative. Even though we, we know from history that um, a, a smaller, weaker country arming itself to defend itself against a potential aggressor, aggressor is not provocative, it is stabilizing. That is, that is how you achieve deterrence. And, but Beijing likes to, to push these narratives through sympathetic politicians sometimes, or through just you know, social media noise and chatter and chit chat, that this idea that that Taiwan should just keep its head down, be quiet, try, try not to offend anybody, and 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 maybe Beijing you know won't won't feel provoked. Uh, but if you read what Xi Jinping's plans are, it, it's nothing about feeling provoked by Taiwan. It, it is very much about uh, a, a, about his global ambitions, his ambition as he puts it, the essence of his overall uh, policy vision, which he calls the Chinese dream for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. He says the essence of that policy is unifying Taiwan and he's threatened force to do that. So um, so we, we, we trick ourselves in, into this sense that, well, well gee, maybe, maybe it's us. Maybe it's because we, we have the temerity to uh, buy some defensive weapons that we're, we're somehow provoking this, this juggernaut, uh, you know, militarized uh, society across the strait. So Taiwan is starting to get its act together. I think President Tsai, who's in her last month in office over the past, uh, particularly the, the past uh, year or, or two, has taken some, some brave steps to expand conscription duty, uh, to, to reorganize her forces to be uh, more rapid in their response to uh, a, uh, a Chinese uh, contingency. And, uh, and but, but there's another thing that we have to bear in mind. Taiwan has been isolated and we've been part of the reason that Taiwan has been so isolated. We've, we've tricked ourselves in the same psychology 
we've said, well, we, maybe we shouldn't do too much with Taiwan because we don't want to upset Beijing. When what we should have been doing was uh, uh, arming them more rapidly, having more training uh, uh, missions to, to bring Taiwanese uh, soldiers uh, here to the United States or to regional countries and to have more of our trainers going to Taiwan. Uh, remember, this is the same trap we fell, fell into after, after Putin invaded in 2014. Uh, the United States decided, well, we don't want to help, we don't want to help Ukraine because that might provoke Putin to do even more. So we refused to sell uh, lethal weapons to Ukraine uh, from 2014 all the way until 2017. And then during the Trump administration, we pro started providing those anti-tank uh, missiles, the javelins and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, thank goodness, because those those are the things that ended up saving Ukraine from from a rapid collapse uh, once there was a full on invasion in 2022. So we we have these cognition traps that we step into where we psych ourselves out. We become self deterring rather than uh, rather than deterring our adversaries. So it sounds like the the recipe would be sort of ten parts deterrence, maybe one part reassurance since the key issue is not so much provoking Beijing, but failing yeah. to deter it. But then I guess my question is, what role should diplomacy play in U.S.-China relations? I've, I've heard you say that high-level talks, meaning presidential talks, having Biden and Xi sit down together are really important. Um, but right now, you know, the most read article on Foreign Affairs' website is an article by you and Congressman Mike Gallagher titled, No Substitute for Victory, America's Competition with China Must Be Won not managed. And in the article, uh, you you guys call for the United States to, to build up its forces in Asia, um, revoke China's most favored nation status and impose a raft of economic restrictions. Um, and you've also said separately that future U.S. leaders should reiterate, should not back away from President Biden's pledge to defend Taiwan against a Chinese attack, which is arguably a, a more strategically clear policy than what had been previous U.S.-Taiwan policy. Um, I don't know if you're already getting emails in your inbox, but I can already hear the critics saying, you know, you, you're, you're not doing enough to balance all this deterrence with some reassurance to Beijing. Reassurance is critical. You have to show Beijing there are good things that can happen to it if it does what the United States wants and bad things if it doesn't do that. And if you're talking tough on Taiwan and you're steadily choking out China's economy, you're just yeah. going to goad Beijing into aggression. So what's your, you can get out ahead yeah. of some of these critics right now. What's your response? How can the United States deter China without provoking a crisis? We've, we've provided plenty of reassurance and Beijing pocket it and, and then and then uh, and then and then tries to reach into our pocket to take more things. The reassurance that we've been providing is a consistent policy going all the way back to the Carter administration that um, we we are not seeking to change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait, and that we at least acknowledge Beijing's position on the Taiwan Strait. We have our own policy uh, that uh, that we explain. Uh, frequently to, to China. The problem is that Xi Jinping is not trying to maintain a status quo. He's not merely trying to prevent Taiwan from becoming independent. He's, he's actually threatening the use of force in order to compel unification against the will of, of Taiwan's uh, vast majority of people. So, uh, so we, we need to keep straight in our heads. Who is the one who is upsetting the balance right now? Who is who is trying to undermine the status quo? It's very clearly uh, Beijing. So uh, I, I'm not calling for a radical change in U.S. policy with respect to uh, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, I, what I'm what I'm calling for is an insurance policy in the form of credible deterrence. So diplomacy is important, but diplomacy isn't going to matter if. Even President Biden saying, as he said four times, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he did say that he would uh, defend Taiwan, none of that is going to matter if Beijing doesn't believe we have the capability to back that up, or if Taiwan lacks the capability, and if Japan uh, uh, wants to sit it out, which which I don't think would happen. I think Japan would be uh, the first uh, actor right there with the United States to respond militarily to a Taiwan contingency. But if we don't show that we have the capability, if we if we don't show that we have good planning and good coordination between those actors, not to mention Australia and, and other partners, 
then Beijing is going to be tempted to believe that we're bluffing. And then you could have the same kind of catastrophic uh, collapse of deterrence that we experienced in February of 2022 in Ukraine or what's happening now in the Middle East. Uh, now you've got the Chinese and the Russians and the, the Iranians supporting Nicolas Maduro, who's a tin pot dictator in Venezuela. And he's now talking about invading his neighbor, Guyana. And he's getting diplomatic material uh, and economic uh, and intelligence support from, uh, from China. So, uh, I mean, when are we going to learn here? <laughs> you know, we're, watching, we're watching the 30s play out in, 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 at you know, high speed right now, and we're still not quite grasping what it is we need to do. Is, is this deterrence, does it also apply to, I, I mean, I hate the term, but gray zone operations. So one of, the, one of the people in the audience asked, what should the U.S. or Taiwanese response be uh, if China seizes an offshore island? So, you know, it seems like it's easier to deter in some ways the big D-Day invasion just because China would have to assume that it's going to activate Taiwanese and U.S. interests very vitally yeah. and uh, they're prepared for it. But if they just take over an island that's a couple of miles off the Chinese coast, is the United yeah. States or Taiwan really going to risk a wider war there? What what should be the appropriate response? Yeah, well, I, the, the, the appropriate response would be that uh, first we have to recognize that those islands would be extremely difficult to um, uh, to successfully defend. Uh, in the event that China went for them just because of mass and size and proximity. But Taiwan should still fight like hell uh, in the event that China does attack. Think, think, of, think of Japan during the Battle of Iwo Jima, where um, it was inevitable that, that Iwo was going to fall uh, to the Americans. But Japan ended up inflicting more harm on U.S. forces uh, than, than, than the number of casualties that the Japanese suffered. That was the first battle in the Pacific where America suffered more casualties in terms of wounded and killed. Uh, Japan, everyone in the Japanese side died, uh, but it was it was a smaller overall number that compared to U.S. wounded and 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 killed. That that was Japan's way of sending a message: okay, if you if you keep coming, it's really going to hurt. And um, and so Taiwan, it's part of the deterrence of an invasion of the main. Uh, islands of Taiwan will be showing that they're willing to fight for those small islands, even though those islands will be would be lost. Now, I don't think it's a very good strategy for Beijing to, to go attacking those offshore islands because what what they will have gained strategically is not really very much. On the other hand, they will have shown their hand that they are an aggressor, that they don't have the interests you know, when Xi Jinping says Chinese don't fight Chinese, that'll be exposed for the lie that it is. Um, the Communist Party was built off of the murder of fellow Chinese, uh, and, and it's still conducting quite a lot of murder within its borders. So um, for them to attack those offshore islands um, will really get the backup of Taiwan society and also get Japan and the United States and and even Europeans to start looking at sanctions packages, to start looking at ways to undermine China's financial system, to impose costs uh, for that kind of reckless behavior. So I don't think that's the smartest uh, approach for Beijing. Doesn't mean that they won't do it. I, I don't think Vladimir Putin has been the brightest bulb in his strategies either. But dictators don't tend to uh, make the most logical decisions sometimes. Okay. The next question is a very easy one. Um, how does this all end? Uh, what's what's the end game for uh, U.S.-China competition? This period we're seeing not just of, frankly, China becoming more aggressive, but obviously the war in Russia and what some people are viewing as sort of uh, connected geopolitical conflicts. Um, and what should the U.S. policy be? Because you know the, the seemingly obvious answer might be to sort of rerun the Reagan playbook, which helped bring the Cold War to a peaceful end, where you build up your capabilities, form alliances, and then negotiate from a position of strength until the other side capitulates Gorbachev style. But the and, and I, I myself have, have written and advocated that basic approach. But the problem uh, that I haven't been able to come up with an answer to is that the Chinese watched Gorbachev dismantle the Soviet Union. And it seems like Xi Jinping has made it his primary directive 
to basically do the exact opposite. Like whatever Gorbachev did, I'm definitely going to do the exact yeah. opposite. So in other words, the peaceful end of the Cold War may make a peaceful end to the U.S.-China rivalry more difficult to achieve. So how, if at all, does the United States need to adjust its Cold War game plan uh, to be different yeah. than the last time to 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 keep this thing under wraps and, and emerge victorious without some horrible war uh, this time around? Well, even though there are, there are a lot of differences between the U.S.-Soviet Cold War and the Cold War that China is waging against us one-sidedly right now, we're, 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 not yet, we're not yet reciprocating and waging a Cold War in return, but, but we should not be under any illusions that Beijing is waging a Cold War against us. Um, there, the lessons, the similarities to, to the two Cold Wars are, are great enough that we could really derive inspiration and even, and even a model for um, uh, some of the steps that we should be taking, irrespective of whether a Democrat or a Republican is, is in the White House. Uh, and some of those lessons include things, and, and Michael, you've written in Foreign Affairs very eloquently about this, but the idea that detente um, is really a dead end for us. Uh, detente, which, which sort of broadly describes loosely a, a bunch of policies that emerged uh, over the course of the 1970s, from the Nixon to the Ford to the first uh, two thirds of the Carter administration, uh, those policies ended up failing for those administrations. You can read John Lewis Gaddis's uh, classic uh, history, Cold War history, uh, strategies of containment, and I think I, th I think he nails it um, in 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 the verdict that those policies failed to achieve their their basic objectives. And so it was during the late Carter administration that uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was a, a Polish emigre to the United States, who was serving as Carter's uh, national security advisor, he was someone who had grown up, his father had been uh, an official in Poland, and he sort of saw the, the, the tragedy of totalitarian ideologies uh, taking over uh, Europe. And so he, he eventually really course corrected on detente and started to have real doubts about what he called the nature of detente and started to impose a much more hard-nosed strategy in response to very damaging steps that the Soviet Union was taking against our interests around the world. The steps they were taking in the 70s are very similar to the steps that Beijing, together with its uh, acolytes in Moscow and Venezuela and Tehran and, and Pyongyang are undertaking right now, basically starting little conflicts and in some cases, big conflicts around the world and using them to weaken us, spread us thin, um, uh, uh, attack our credibility through propaganda campaigns. And finally, Brzezinski said, you know what, you know, the Soviets, on, I think it was Christmas Eve, 1979, the Soviets just invaded Afghanistan. And, and uh, Brzezinski said, you know what, we're going to make this their Vietnam War. And that set the table for the Reagan administration to come in and impose immense costs on the Soviet Union, economically, rhetorically, with candid uh, talk about the nature of the Soviet system. Uh, he was also able to build up our military. Look, President Biden has done a good job of keeping our allies close. I commend him for the, 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 the trilat meeting he's doing uh, uh, this week with the Philippine leader and, and the Japanese. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida gave a great speech yesterday before a joint uh, House of Congress. The, the, the problem is he's not building up hard power. We, we, as you mentioned, we actually are shrinking our defense budget right now in real terms when you adjust for inflation. That's, that's the kind of thinking that got us into World War II. So uh, we need to derive those lessons and, uh, uh, and, and I think it puts us on a path to the end state that I think we should be seeking. The end state is not to merely manage this competition, it is to win it. Beijing is aiming to win, and they're not just aiming to win in Taiwan. They're aiming, look at, look at the big global initiatives. They're called global initiatives, by the way, in case, in case we, uh, you know, we thought this was a subtle strategy. Beijing has a global security initiative to dissolve U.S. alliances globally, a, a global civilizational initiative to uh, dissipate democracy and replace it with an, an authoritarian or even totalitarian model globally, and a global development initiative, which is designed to supplant market capitalism with uh, what Xi Jinping calls a, a Marxist new model of development for the world. So, you know, at some point, 
you, you have to actually start listening to what Xi Jinping's saying. And and so the end state we should go to for is to win. That what would winning look like? It would look like similar to to what it was looking like by the time Reagan left office, but before the Soviet Union had actually collapsed under the, the following U.S. administration. It looked like this. The Soviets began to convince themselves, or really we were persuading them uh, uh, quite convincingly, that they were going to lose. They weren't going to be able to win uh, a hot war against the United States, and they weren't going to be able to win their Cold War. That, in turn, had a knock-on effect because it started to feed self-doubt about their whole model. And their model was one in which they had a, uh, a, a sclerotic economy where all resources were being mobilized for military means and growing their nuclear arsenal and their, their, uh, their large navy and so forth. If you look at, even though Xi Jinping has villainized Gorbachev and is trying to, trying to avoid a Gorbachev future as best he can, he's almost like, you know, the, the uh, protagonist in Oedipus Rex, the more he tries to escape his, um, you know, this destiny, the more he might run right into it because he's making the same mistakes the Soviets uh, were, were making early in the Reagan administration. They were putting all of their, their money into uh, military capacity. And the United States was starting to offset through, um, through our own military buildup and our superior technology, starting to offset and to render wasteful much of, of the economic uh, uh, treasure that, that uh, the Soviets were putting in, into their military. And meanwhile, the Chinese economy it, it, it is looking pretty ugly right now. I, you know, I, I'm, I can't tell you how many meetings I have with private sector actors, whether they're technology companies or they're just hedge funds or what have you. They're all pulling out of China. And and, um, and and so this is this is not our doing. This is Xi Jinping's own doing, and we should help him help nudge him along uh, to to continue making those mistakes. I what, think that. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. No, no, that's. That, that's I was going to uh, say, well, what's your what's your assessment of the timeline then? So you mentioned China's economy is slowing down. It's seeding some of the strategic encirclement going on. Um, you know, the first Cold War lasts forty five years. Uh, this strategy that you're calling for, um, what what's your assessment of how long China is going to be able to keep up its breakneck militarization? Um, you know, what, what's what's the time frame here? Well, we, we've been in a Cold War, one-sided Cold War with Beijing going back to, to really pretty soon after the Soviet Union collapsed, except Deng Xiaoping was was actually a smart strategist. And, and he said, look, we're, we know who our top enemy in the world is. It's America. They are our top ideological competitor, geopolitical competitor, and uh, as well as military competitor. Rush Doshi in his book, The Long Game, captures that moment using primary source Chinese documents. So they've been waging a Cold War one-sided for 30 plus years. We haven't even joined the fight yet. We're only starting to say, hey, wait a minute, we're kind of getting a raw deal here. You know, that's a, that, finally some smelling salts have been put under our nose but we haven't yet focused on what we need to do. We need to have the confidence that if we actually do take a page from, from Reagan, we're gonna win this thing. I have no doubt that we will if we get our act together and stop with this sort of self-doubt, self-loathing. Prime Minister Kishida yesterday gave us a pep talk. I don't know if you noticed, but he said, hey, look, I'm noticing that Americans are beginning to have a lot of self-doubt about themselves and about their system of government. Let me just give it to you straight. You know, this is, we're going to end up with a really bad world if America stops acting like America. So please stop acting like yourselves. I thought it was a great pep talk that he gave us, and uh, and and we should uh, we should you know embrace that spirit and uh, and 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 win this thing. Well, I think I think it might have been a necessary pep talk because I was looking at some statistics, and this one really shocked me. So in 1998, not that long ago, seventy uh, percent of Americans said that patriotism was very important to them. In 2023, that number was down to 38%. And for adults under 30, only 23%. So less than one in four young adults said that love of country is important to them. Uh, you've spent most of your career in public service. And so I'm wondering, do you, do you worry about a decline in Americans' sense of civic duty such that we need Japanese leaders basically to come here and give us these pep talks? And what, what would you say to those 77% 
of young adults yeah. that don't feel particularly patriotic. And I'm not asking you, no one wants a lecture, you know, I'm, you're, you're certainly not, <laughs> yeah. you're a very nice yeah. guy, so you're not going to berate them, but maybe you could just talk about why you decided to dedicate so much of your own life to serving the country. Yeah. Well, look, first I'll, I'll say that, um, um, uh, American kids today are just the same in, 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 you know, they start out the same as American kids from a generation ago or two or three generations ago that what they've had to contend with is a, um, a, a, a failed higher education system that, that was not failed uh, when I when I was uh, growing up, um, and, and so they they have to swim against that um, rancid uh, waterfall where uh, people are not are not trying to teach history even very much anymore. They're teaching uh, other social sciences and and political science departments have kind of exploded, and political science uh, departments are laboratories for theory, but but they often get really, really far removed from uh, factual case studies. So I'd love to see us return to, uh, to more history. Um, I, I would love to see the people who fund universities pay attention to where their money's been going and to start uh, going after what make, make Veritas a, a real uh, a motto again, truth, the seeking of truth, not weird activism. Um, so that's one part of it. The other is the social media landscape. And it, 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 the social media landscape is problematic, even in a purely American context. But when you when you take something like TikTok, which is governed by all of TikTok's algorithms are, are subject to Communist Party control in China, the editor in chief and deputy editor in chief of TikTok's uh, parent company are but also the Communist Party secretary and deputy secretary of those companies, they're dual hatted um, and, and are committed to aligning um, the algorithms, ByteDance, uh, the parent company ByteDance's algorithms to the Communist Party's goals. It's little wonder that we're seeing gross skewing in the kind of content that gets suppressed or gets amplified on TikTok compared to American platforms. So, you know, we can deal with the pathologies and problems of the American platforms, but we're not even going to get that far if we don't um, get uh, Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington, D.C., who's the most important person in America right now, because she's sitting on a bill that passed the House of Representatives, 362, 300, a 362 vote majority. You can't get anyone to agree on anything in Washington today. Yet the House of Representatives agrees that TikTok should not be under Communist Party control. It needs to divest and fall under the control of American owners. That is not controversial. That's not, a, that's, that's not inconsistent with our First Amendment rights. And yet there's a senator who's sitting on it, stalling, and, and I fear seeking to water down that bill so that the Communist Party may end up continuing to control TikTok. If that happens, um, uh, we're, we're in really, really deep trouble. It means that the single largest uh, media owner in, in America is Xi Jinping. This would have been incomprehensible. Even in the 1930s, we outlawed uh, uh, concentration of foreign media ownership, uh, specifically because we didn't want the Nazis to own all of our radio stations and newspapers in America. That wasn't inconsistent with the, the First Amendment. In fact, those laws are still on the books. Now they need to be updated for, for the information age and, and we can't allow half of Americans to get their news from Xi Jinping. It's, it's I mean, listen, listen to what I say that. It's so obvious. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't yet, seem like a great move to have your main geopolitical adversary control. Well, the way write, write a, please write a letter to Senator Maria Cantwell of <laughs> I Washington will. State. I, I, I will I'm, do my best. I'm, I'm hoping that she uh, does the right thing here. Uh, okay. set, three of her staff are now full-time lobbyists for TikTok. They, they left her, her staff in order to lobby for TikTok. That's not a great sign, but please, um, uh, uh, anyway, I, I hope she I'll does the right the message. Thing. Well, I have a question related to that. So I, I totally get the the threat that TikTok poses and, and why you see such a robust response from people saying this, this cannot stand. We can't keep it like this. But what about more broadly um, in terms of how do you balance 
the need to insulate the United States from Chinese political warfare, from economic threats, from espionage, but also not end up becoming like an authoritarian you know, Chinese state that just bans stuff that it doesn't like, uh, you know, whether it's a Confucius Institute at a school uh, or, you know, students that are trying to from China that are trying to come over and, and uh, get a Ph.D. in a science and or engineering field. You know, we talked about these Cold War grand strategies and, you know, George Kennan's famous long telegram. He says a lot of stuff in there. But one thing he says is um, we can, don't become like our adversaries, don't become yeah. like them. Um, and I think that often gets short shrift. So what how, can, can you just talk generally, how, how should we be thinking about how to balance the need to insulate the United States from security threats from China, and, yeah. and frankly, well, Taiwan too, uh, while, yeah. while maintaining who we are? I don't think we should ever ban speech. Um, the, 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 the call for divestiture, you know, a divestment of TikTok to American ownership is actually in order to ensure that TikTok can continue and people can post whatever they want. No one is talking about a, their problem with a particular thing that gets posted. The problem is who actually gets to, gets to control that speech. Right now, Beijing decides whether that gets heard and amplified or whether it just gets muted down to just you know friends and family seeing what you uh, what you posted. So in fact, the violation of free speech rights. Is, is, is happening on TikTok uh, with Beijing controlling or suppressing your speech. I, I, I would like to see TikTok owned by Americans and, and, and for those Americans to be subject to US law, including our first amendment, which would not permit uh, people to have their speech suppressed and so forth. So I'm, I'm 100% of George Kennan's view that we don't want to, uh, 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 you know, we have to have the courage of, of, of our own convictions uh, about our own, um, uh, you know, Bill of Rights. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I agree with you, I guess. Okay. Well, I, I know you love getting questions about uh, Donald Trump and, and what you think about Donald Trump and whether you would serve in another Trump administration. I'm not going to ask you any of those, but, you know, Trump has secured the Republican nomination. He could very well be president again. And so just in general, do you, do you expect, if, if there is going to be another Trump administration, do you, would you expect that it would sort of pick off pick up where it left off in terms of China policy? Uh, how might its policies specifically towards Taiwan, um, but more broadly towards China and the Indo-Pacific be the same or different than his first term? Do you have any sense of that? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I'm, I'm just watching um, um, Donald Trump's, what he's saying on his campaign trail. And, and, and a lot of it feels familiar to me uh, in the sense that he is very heavily focused on, um, on trade <clears throat> he views uh, the America's trade deficit as as a uh, as a serious uh, liability for us. He views Chinese theft of intellectual property and, and so forth as a major thing, you know, a, a continuing problem. So I suspect that he is going to be focused if he does get reelected on uh, trade balances generally, but in particular uh, China and. Um, he's talked a lot about uh, electric vehicles. You know, he he, think, he talks about cars a lot. He has you know his whole adult life. I the, the sort of sense I get from from his on the campaign trail comments is that he wants to impose significant tariffs to make it difficult for China to actually sell cars from outside of our borders into the United States. But he but he also seems welcoming of the idea of building automobiles in the United States, that if China wants to build them here, um, and that, that, that's that been his consistent view with Japanese car makers and the others. What's interesting though, is that, that President Biden is starting to outflank Trump on this issue because Biden is talking about Chinese EVs as a national security threat, not just a trade threat. And so President Biden has, uh, has, undertaken a new investigation using an authority that President Trump created. By the way, it, President Trump created an executive order that gives the Commerce Department the right to block foreign technologies from adversary states if those technologies might pose a, uh, a, a national security threat. Biden's using that Trump era executive order for the first time to investigate Chinese electric vehicles to see whether we should ban them altogether, not just from being built in Mexico or China, but even from being built in the United States, because they're loaded with thousands of chips. 
Chinese EVs record your voice, the, the voice of everyone who's talking in a car. All that gets recorded and sent back. The car can be disabled. It can be steered. You know, all kinds of it can be tracked um, uh, from uh, uh, from a far distance. And so the Commerce Department is now undertaking this kind of an investigation. Um, I think it'd be wise for, for for President Trump to look at a similar, you know, use his own, you know, take credit for the executive order that he signed and, and actually uh, uh, promise to undertake an even more thorough investigation of the national security risks of Chinese EVs. All right. Well, Matt Pottinger, thank you for your time, for your insights, for your service to the country. And thank you to everyone in the audience and for all of our supporters and members for making this possible. Take care, everyone. It was a great event. And Matt, I hope to see you sometime uh, soon. Safe travels. You bet. Thank you.